1971, Alan Paleo came up with his groundbreaking breakthrough in uh, cognitive psychology, the idea of dual coding. In his words, to present learners with a mixture of visual stimulus and verbal explanation. The question that I want to address here is, are we doing it right in science? What are the various forms of it? And whether or not we've actually been doing it for much longer than we realised. Some subjects have had very didactic techniques. Uh, the, the techniques for learning have very much been, uh, in some subjects, potentially reading and then trying to understand from reading or perhaps uh, doing or problem solving. One of the things about science is it's always been demonstrated. Now that demonstration could be argued was dual coding before dual coding even was known. <laughs> so the whole idea of demonstrating an experiment, there's the visual coding, whilst the science teacher explains it is the verbal coding. The idea or the narrowing of dual coding down to simplified diagrams being the visual part is more of a, a, a more recent take on it. But more generally, if we mix that verbal explanation with something visually interesting and connected, then it is dual coding. And what we've been doing in science is we've been doing that for hundreds of years. Let me give you some examples of things that you may not even realize are dual coding, but actually are. So here I am talking through some apparatus that I've got out. Now you might not recognize this as dual coding, but what's going on here is I'm actually showing you things and describing it. Here, the visual stimulus is coded in a different way. It's not diagrammatic, it's symbolic. Graphs representing the information that I'm trying to convey is also a part of what is stimulating uh, the learner visually. Of course, the explanation that goes through it is the key thing. Are the learners listening to what I'm saying and looking at the diagrams at the same time? Another good example is models. If I am showing that this thing represents something else, then this thing that I can physically hold in my hand actually acts as the stimulus. Now, all of these techniques have been the craft of a science teacher for very many years. But did you realise it was dual coding? As a consequence, including these techniques in your lessons is dual coding, even conventional diagram drawing. They don't have to be whizzy. They don't have to be uh, made on the best graphics package ever, but simple chalk on a blackboard. Or diagrams that you have sketched. If they are combined with a verbal explanation, then you're more likely to actually gauge and understand and take in and learn. With more people experimenting with dual coding, there's been a divergence in the understanding of its meaning. Some have taken it to mean that any uh, piece of information represented in two different ways is an example of dual coding. Um, this is technically not what dual coding started out as. I understand the logic of why that would be beneficial, for if, if you represent it diagrammatically twice, a diagram and a diagram, you might not gauge it from one diagram, but you might get it from the other. Drawing the atoms of a nuclear fission chain reaction and drawing the formula underneath uh, is taken by some now to be dual coding, because I've coded it in two different ways. Now technically, as it started, it was simply pictorial, visual stimulation and verbal. But now this idea that if we, if we take that representing something symbolically as formula, as different from representing it pictorially as pictures, are two different ways to code, then is that a type of dual coding? I leave that for you to decide. There's also the argument as whether or not both things have to be at the same time, concurrent. What about if you show something and then explain it? So the actual sequence of show and tell, show and tell. And quite often, what I would do is I would show a diagram, I would show the physical apparatus, and, and I would be aware 
the, the cognitive load would be very high to a learner. All of the wires sticking out, all of the extra bits, all of the fuss, all of the noise, what it is that the learner is supposed to learn from seeing that will be lost on some people. The cognitive load will be too high and they won't learn the key thing that you wish for them to learn. So what I would then do is I would try to code it differently. I'd represent the same thing in a different format, perhaps draw a simplified diagram. And in both of those cases, I would try to then connect this diagram as representing that complex real life scenario by making sure that the verbal parts of my explanation are, the, are similar or are the same both times. I would say, and this is the fuel rod, and this fuel rod is placed here and there are control rods between it. On this diagram you can see here are the fuel rods and you can see how the control rods can slide down between them. Using the same language to describe the two different visual stimuluses will help them to connect the fact that this represents the same thing as that. When we dual code, what do we expect the learners to be doing? See, there's a problem here, and I've done this myself, that you start your dual coding and you start talking about a picture like this, and you feel that this somehow is not a rich enough learning experience. So you say to the pupils, write down what I'm saying. Make notes as we go along. We've all done it. That we somehow believe or we conflate the idea that the process of making notes which is good for learners right it helps to consolidate and it helps them to organize their thoughts and they have to actually process it once in the route from their senses to their work if we put that in at the same time as we are dual coding then what's going to happen is whilst they are going through that process that is going to cause cognitive overload what they're going to find is they've stopped listening so that they can hear their inner monologue, so that they can write down what their inner monologue is saying in its sort of explanation to self. For effective dual uh, coding, what you have to say to the pupils is put it down. Don't write this down. Shut your computer. Make it so that there's nothing else physically to do. And then get them listening and looking. If they're not looking, they're not getting it. If they're not listening, they're not getting it. Having a device open acts against the power of dual coding. Making your notes acts against it. You need them engaging and thinking. So what I recommend is spacing. Once you have done your dual coding, they write it down. But of course, there's only so much you can say before you exceed their working memory. You can say more than they can remember. So what you need to do is chunk it down. Give a bit. What are the problems with this? That some learners are much quicker than other learners at this. So those will be like, gotcha, and in two seconds we'll have written it down, but other people will be still trying to think it through. And that difference in tempo would mean that some people are struggling to write it down in the time interval you've allowed. Other people are getting bored because there's time. So it's quite useful to have something else to do. Something not particularly distracting, but maybe something just on the side, like a glossary. So that if a pupil find themselves with 30 seconds and nothing to do, what they can do is they can write down some of the new terms and words they've used, the vocab, and what they mean. And then they can very quickly come from this task back into what it is that they're doing for the next chunk and here. So for those reasons, I think dual coding is great, but I think it is time limited. It can't go on too long because it will exceed the working memory of the pupils. And it cannot go on for the whole lesson either. The pupil has to, at some point, consolidate what they have taken from it and, some way, document it. So the logical step is this. If, when we're dual coding, we should stop to enable the sort of uh, thinking about what it is that has been said, 
or the consolidation by writing down what has been said, then it means that we have to break our dual coding into chunks. Now, if we have earlier made the suggestion that all of the other things that we do in science are the visual stimulus of dual coding, the demonstrations, the models, the use of formula, the use of graphs, the use of diagrams, all of these things should be chunked bit by bit by bit so that we don't overflow. Immediately after the Second World War, the step-by-step uh, the -step experiment uh, came into vogue. The demonstrators in schools across the country would give the pupils of their, in their classes step-by-step -step instructions. Now, and the step-by-step -step instructions could be written down, step one, step two, step three, but actually what was more common in those early days was vocal instructions. To do one thing, and then there was a pause, and everyone would do that thing, and do the next thing, and there was a pause. And this had the effect of making all of the procedural elements of it straightforward without having to think too carefully. But then, at the point where there was the key piece of information that was trying to be gained from the experiment, what was the key learning that this experiment was going to tell people, is at that stage, the longer pause, the longer moment for reflection, and the explanation from the teacher. So these techniques have been used in science for 70 to 100 years. And now that they're being used in other subjects as well, it's really to credit those early pioneers, those early teachers, that naturally without these things being formalized, without cognitive psychology um, being described and vocabulary describing its various nuances made, that all of this was actually going on in science labs in the 1950s and 1960s. That's why for me, I'm very careful never to claim that I have invented a technique because what I appreciate is with all of our modern ideas now, the wheel has turned. The, they've come back in vogue, but they existed 30, 40 years ago. And for that reason, I don't myself make the sort of grandiose claim that they've come out of my head just because I've independently either discovered them or I've read them somewhere, forgot about them, and then thought I've invented them a second time. I'm really, really careful when talking about educational theory to try and find the source or an example of someone using this back in the past. Because we owe nearly everything we do to those pioneers of education. And not just, okay, we've had a revolution with cognitive psychology in the last few years, but all of it is rooted in older work. And we cannot forget, and we cannot dismiss that old work as being somehow uh, like, like AD and BC. It's, it's, no, it's not Old Testament and new. It, the cognitive psychology has its origins in that work. And so we should really put credit where credit's due. And to those, those teachers that are now retired, thank you so much. And we are running with the ball, and we hope to take it new places.